Now, <clears throat> as we continue our series through the faith, I want to start this session with a passage in Galatians chapter 2, if you'll turn there. And I want to show you an illustration of something that's very unique, actually, and it stands out, really. Galatians chapter 2, we'll start down at verse 11. I'll read the passage, uh, and then we'll talk about it. We are, what we've done so far in our study, we've looked at the passages of Scripture that speak of the faith, and they're, they're numerous. I don't know, I didn't count them all. I think there's probably around a dozen or so. Specific instances where the faith is made reference to. Uh, in our second passage today, and we'll get to Timothy here in a few minutes, uh, we're warned about men departing from the faith, and we need to talk about that. From the inception of the church, first century Christianity, the apostolic era, the, the uh, truth of the gospel um, and loyalty to the gospel has always been an issue. Now, the truth of the gospel is never going to pass away. The gospel will never change. But the people that are entrusted with the message, they can be unfaithful. They can depart. Through subtle temptations, they can compromise the truth of the gospel. This was real in the first century. It's still real. It's been a battle down through 2,000 years of church history. And you better know something as I'm talking to you today. The church of Jesus Christ is in a battle in this old world. And uh, if you don't understand that, um, I don't know what to tell you. You, you must... Uh, have your head buried in the sand, so to speak, or else um, you, uh, you're just not in the battle quite like pastors are, I guess, but uh, you'll get a taste of it along the way. We are constantly being invited to give up the faith, constantly tempted to compromise the truth of the gospel. Um, there's entirely too much of this going on, certainly in the American church. I don't know much about other parts of the world, but uh, in America, there's entirely too much compromise. Now, in the apostles' days, Paul and Peter, they had a confrontation. These two boys are heavy hitters, if you want to say it that way. I mean, they, they are, you know, Peter, he's one of the pillars of the young church. Paul, you know his history. Uh, apostle to the Gentiles and the great champion of the gospel of the grace of God, as were the others. But they had an experience. Amen. And uh, Paul withstood Peter to the face. Uh, you know, one thing I've noticed about Paul, and I, I don't think I'm out of place saying this, he wasn't a go along to get along kind of guy. He shot, you know, he, he aimed it straight and he shot straight. And if you compromise the gospel, he was going to have a word with you. Uh, he knew the seriousness of it, and, and every minister of the gospel better know the seriousness of it. I, I don't know sometimes what ministers of the gospel are doing these days. Uh, we're not entertainers. We are servants of the living God, called of God to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not here to put on programs that simply tickle the flesh or entertain a wide variety of uh, uh, felt needs that people seem to have. God's called us to preach the word. He wants us to train you in the faith. And this is so essential. Look, if you gained the whole world, but you lost your soul, what good would it do you? If the Christian community becomes like Laodicea in the book of Revelation, the Christian community in America becomes like the Laodiceans. Oh, don't you know, Lord, we're rich and increased with goods and we have need of nothing. And the Lord's looking and saying, don't you know you're miserable, wretched, naked and poor? Uh, buy of me the gold tried in the fire. See, there was a real issue there. This was in the professing church. The letters of the revelation were written to seven local churches, seven real churches in Asia, what is known today as Turkey. The Lord spoke to the visible church. And there was problems then, there's problems today. And, uh, but, you know, a lot of times we get arrogant, we get proud, and uh, we let knowledge puff us up. We get away from Scripture. We start compromising the gospel and dare anybody to correct us. 
Well, I got news for you guys. Now, you, you guys pray for me. I don't want to get too far away from my nose, but I'm going to tell you something. There is not one minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ who is unaccountable to the church. We don't have any popes. Now, that illustration might help you understand the point. We don't claim infallibility for any of our people. We are accountable. And I don't care if you've sold 50 million books. I don't care if you've done well as far as the worldly kind of success is concerned. You know, if our success parallels what the world calls success, well, we better just be good stewards of God's blessing. We march to the beat of a different drummer here. We're not, we're not of the same spirit. There's a whole batch of issues for us in regard to stewardship. We certainly don't want nothing to do with the spirit of the world. But I'm just telling you, it doesn't matter how prominent we seem to be. We are accountable. We're not free to teach anything that just suits our fancy. And we're not called to preach uh, our own ideas and preach our opinions. We're called to preach the word. So if I preach something, you are to test it. You don't just say, oh, Brother Russ said that. That's got to be right. Well, if I'm preaching the word, it'll be right. But I'm just an earthen vessel. I have a fallibility about myself. I have to be corrected. And so does every other minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So listen, hold us accountable. And if we compromise the truthfulness of the gospel, we are to be called on the carpet, pulled to the side, maybe brought into a council of godly men and said, and, and to which we can answer and, and they can ask us the question, what do you think you're preaching? Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. It says, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. That is Paul talking because he was to be blamed. Uh, <laughs> Peter, Peter was a fallible man. He was a spirit-filled man of God. The Lord Jesus used him. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Paul, I'm sure, needed correction in other contexts. I'm sure he received it. The point is, we're fallible. And Peter, Paul says, he was to blame. What's the issue? Well, verse 12 says, for before that certain came from James. Now, James was in Jerusalem. He was the, you might say, the pastor of the church there in Jerusalem at the time. He was one of the spiritual leaders. Well, before that certain came from James, the ones that would have been coming from James down where Peter was were Jews. They were Messianic Jews. They had received Christ as Savior. I mean, all the first believers in the church came out of the Jewish community. That's where it started. Well, here they come. They're coming for a visit. And it says here, before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. So Peter has been... Uh, doing exactly what the gospel would dictate. There's no difference between the Jew and Gentile. Both are saved by the same gospel, by the same gospel of the grace of God. Both have the same Savior. Both come to God the same way, that is by faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter knew this. And Peter was amongst the Gentiles. And he fellowshiped with Gentile believers. He wasn't just going in amongst lost men. He was in the church, the professing church, people that had come to know Christ. They just happened to be Gentiles. They weren't Jewish. Well, there was an element in the early church that still was zealous about the law, and they wanted to compel the early church to keep the law, and that is a pretty big issue in the New Testament. Well, <clears throat> what did Brother Peter do when these boys showed up from out of town? It says, but when they were come, the visitors arrived, he withdrew and separated himself. Peter said, uh oh, these Jewish brothers from down in Jerusalem, they're not going to look too kindly on me associating with these Gentile boys. So he actually withdrew. And he stopped hanging out with the Gentile believers. Why? Right there, fearing them which were of the circumcision. 
And the other Jews <laughs> dissembled likewise. So Peter's example is influencing other believers that happen to be Jewish. And they started to do the same thing. They said, well, we better separate from the Gentiles. Insomuch that Barnabas, now this is Paul talking, Barnabas is one of his right-hand men. You know, they, they went on some mission trip together. Uh, they were co-workers together. He says, insomuch that Barnabas was also carried away with their dissimulation. Now look at this verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. Just stop right there. Try to get your arms around what has evolved here. Peter is giving the impression to the Gentile believers that their faith in Christ is not enough. Are you with me, Brad? This is exactly what his behavior is communicating. You talk about preaching a sermon without ever opening your mouth. Brother Peter was preaching a sermon and it happened to be the wrong one. Amen. And Paul said, I looked at this and I said, uh-oh, they're not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. So Paul, I don't know where the setting was, but he found Mr. Peter and he confronted him face to face. I don't know how many of the rest of the crowd was there. I imagine there was a number. Probably wasn't any Gentiles in the room just then. But uh, <laughs> Paul confronted him. Amen. And he said, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, which he had been going in and out freely amongst the Gentiles, and he was free to do this. And not as do the Jews, okay? So he wasn't observing the old, the, the, the old covenant anymore. He wasn't um, embracing all their tradition and so forth. Uh, he says, if thou being a Jew, he was physically, you're living after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews. Why compellest thou the Gentiles then to live as do the Jews? Because you're sending the message to the Gentiles Faith in Christ is not enough. You're going to have to pick up the law of Moses and start practicing like they do. Now, I want you to know that this was a contention. I doubt that they were eating donuts and drinking coffee at that moment. I think Paul was kind, but he was firm. And I believe he's looking Peter right in the eyes. He's saying, Peter, you're wrong. You're compromising the truth of the gospel. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, verse 15, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Now see right here, Paul is getting to the heart of the matter. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that is, we that are Jews by nature. We've placed our faith in the Lord Jesus, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh, no man, Jew or Gentile, be justified, that is, in the sight of God. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. Paul is saying, Peter, the Lord can't put his blessing on your behavior. You're out of order. You are contradicting the truthfulness of the gospel. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the works of the law. Oh, excuse me. I read that wrong. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain, or he died for nothing. You know what I think Brother Peter did? I think he said, Paul, you're right. My behavior has been unbecoming of the gospel. Now, why am I reading this? We're in a series on the faith. And the things that we're talking about are not 
trivial. The truths that we're talking about are simply not up for debate. There are core teachings of the church that every segment of the body of Christ, I don't care what your ethnic background is, I don't care if you live in the north, the south, the east, the west, I don't care. The faith consists of defined doctrine, fixed truth. And the truth of the gospel doesn't bend for new generations that come on the scene. You say, well, we're just tired of doing things the way the church has done it forever. Well, I don't care if you dot your I's and cross your T's a little bit different, but if you're telling me you're tired of the old rugged cross and the blood of Jesus and we just don't want to preach that message anymore, then it's time for you to get born again. You don't even know the Lord. Amen. And that would go for some of you that call yourself preachers. If we gather in churches or we have this broad segment of society that calls themselves Christians and at the same time are saying, oh, we don't believe Jesus is the only way to, the, to God anymore. Well, this is actually happening in America. Oh, we, we don't believe. There's other ways too. That is paramount to denying the name of Jesus Christ. There's no way around. Uh, just like Paul confronted Peter because Peter's behavior, now Peter isn't so much teaching wrong doctrine, although his behavior is contradicting the truth of the gospel, which in effect's the same thing. You see, he confronted him because Peter was straying away from the truth of the gospel. Well, what are spiritual minded believers to do in the church today? Uh, look, <clears throat> I'm just a foot washer. I'm just a servant of the Lord Jesus. Brad, I just want to be a faithful minister of the gospel. Well, if somebody in the church wants to come along saying that Jesus is not the only way anymore, I think people like me and thousands of others who know the Lord, I'm talking about the authentic church, we need to confront those people. Amen. And that would include pastors. You do it by just preaching the gospel. You don't have to be contentious. I'm not trying to be contentious. But I tell you what, my math teacher, I don't know. I, I never thought of him as being contentious, but to, he always insisted that two plus two equals four. And if I put down five, he'd mark it in red. Red. You guys don't get that. It's an old reality. But um, <clears throat> I never thought he was being contentious. Right was right. Certain things is just fixed truth. But when we come to spiritual matters, there's no absolute truth. So a bunch of unbelievers say, uh, people that know the Lord and know the Spirit of God, they would never make such a short-sighted statement as that. If they did, once corrected, they'd receive it and get that straightened out pretty quick. No absolute truth. What does John 14, 6 mean? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Amen. The truth, Jesus, the truth is bound up in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is absolute truth. He is the truth. And we got these folks just pandering to every whim of the world, and they're so afraid. You know what people want to do in the church, a lot of segments of the church today, and this is true in America, it's a growing reality, unfortunately. We want to take the offense of the cross out of our message. It offends people to tell people that Jesus is the only way. It offends people to tell, tell them that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. I mean, God come in the flesh. Yes. School has started. I have the privilege of teaching a group of high schoolers in our school. And we are in the book of John. And um, some things I do on purpose. I'm teaching John in Sunday school. Turn right around and teach it to this group of high schoolers. Man, I get practiced up. I'm just ready. I mean, look out. 
But here's the deal. You know where we started at John chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word's God. Now, these kids have been learning, so, you know, this is line upon line. And I'm so excited about it because faith 